Hello and welcome again. Uh, today I have a really, really very special guest. And uh, let me introduce Dr. Philip Bretz. He's a dedicated breast cancer surgeon and researcher. He's the founder and director of Visionary Breast Centers and a co-founder of GenTest IR. Uh, he has cared for well over 12,000 women and publishes his results in peer-reviewed journals as well as invited presentations around the world. His mantra is to preserve mind, body, and spirit, something he doesn't take too lightly. That's right. Uh, that's right. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me just put my eyes on so I can see a little better. Uh, he has continuously refined his approach to diagnosing and treating breast cancer to where now we can accomplish the diagnosis without radiation at about three to five millimeters and treat the cancer without the need for traditional surgery, chemotherapy, or radiation. This will make a difference in the world. Uh, and I'm sure anyone who is watching this, uh, I hope you're sitting. Uh, his surgical career spans for over 30 years and includes being an integral part of the open heart surgical team at Eisenhower Memorial Hospital in California, where the team did over 4,000 open heart procedures. By the way, they had the lowest mortality rate in the country. And he was the assistant surgeon on First Lady Betty Ford heart surgery. He has carried the principal investigator number 17790 from the National Cancer Institute for over 20 years. Aside from being the designated surgical liaison to the American College of Surgeons, he served as chairman of the Cancer Committee at Eisenhower and was first to bring National Cancer Institute clinical trials to um, Coquella Valley at Eisenhower. He was the designated principal investigator for the National S Surgical Edgewund Breast Project, the largest breast cancer uh, research group in the country. He also served as a civilian physician uh, aboard the Marine Air Ground Combat Center at um, 29 Palms mm -hmm. for four years. Um, he was the principal speaker at President Bush's um, Breast Cancer Panel and was awarded the Carnegie Medal for Heroism, as well as two medals of excellence given by the Commanding General of the 332nd Medical Brigade. For him, his significant achievement is research is being the author of uh, the country's first large-scale breast cancer prevention clinical trial using the well-known drug tamoxifen. He wrote a 400-page book on his experience called Sacrificing American Women. He has developed and published a unique surgical procedure to augment accelerated partial breast radiation and over the past six years has done the groundbreaking research on the five technologies necessary to reach our goal. He has been married to his wife Joan for 45 years and together has raised four, and I underline, productive children. It's 50 uh, years now. Oh, 50 <laughs> years now, so I'm reading old news. Uh, she put up with me for 50 years. Yeah. Well, uh, after so, so many years, uh, you know, who's counting? What are you going to uh, do? Yeah. <laughs> so right now he serves as chief medical officer and chief of surgery. So once again, welcome. Thank you. It's an honor and, and a pleasure to talk to you. Well, it's an honor to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you. There's not very many of us out there so that we can talk to each other. So Well... <laughs> yeah. um, and that's why we're recording this conversation. That's Hopefully right. other people will find it useful and productive and I, interesting. Sure. So Dr. Yeah. Bretz, what led you to, after so many kind of surgeries and, and being so uh, 
so kind of um, in contact with, with thousands and thousands of women. What led you to what you're doing right now? Uh, I probably can go back to my surgical residency uh, at Loyola in Chicago. Um, you know, to, and to be fair to them, I mean, we did big time surgeries there and that's how I was trained. And, um, you know, the second question we were always asked besides when we came out of the OR was, you know, is she okay, doc? Yeah. Well, well doc, did you get all the cancer, doc? You get all the cancer? Oh yeah. We got all that cancer that we could see and we just destroyed. I mean, I, I call it on my TED Talk, um, which you can go to say Google Dr. Brett's TED Talk. I, I call it uh, Holocaust on Women, um, which I participated in. And I um, <laughs> looked at those surgeries and I said, my God, we, I, I have to do something to, to make this better. Uh, there's got to be a different way than this. And so I spent my whole career, outside of the nine years I spent on the open heart team, and our mortality rate was actually 0.6%. Um, and we had the highest level of octogenarians as well. So we weren't just cherry picking people. But anyway, um, you know, I, 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 when I first got to Eisenhower in 79, I was the first one to do a lumpectomy. And we had just, Umberto Vernisi at the Tumor Institute of Milan uh, had come out with his seminal paper uh, about lumpectomy versus mastectomy. And the results were the same. And of course, they still are 40 years later um, or more. Um, and, you know, I was told by the old guard surgeons there, but, you know, if you don't take off that breast, all your patients are going to die. And I thought, oh, Jesus, and thank you. And of course, they didn't die, did they? No, they didn't. And, and you know, I, I got involved with uh, the NSABP, which is, has 500 uh, clinical centers that do clinical trials in the United States and Canada, by the way. Okay. And, um, you know, we participated in, uh, we pioneered the neoadjuvant chemotherapy and and that was the way we did it back then you know i was hook line and sinker because women were dying and and that was the that was the the way to save them and and we did save a lot of them uh and and um but i still thought you know this has got to be this has got to be different uh, i i developed what i called uh, uh cosmetic lumpectomy and there's a, you know, if you ask a doctor, oh, you do lumpectomies, you know, back then, of course, everybody does lumpectomies now. Um, and and uh, they would say, oh, yeah, we do a lumpectomy. And what they did was they just ellipsed out the tumor like that, okay, right over it. And, right. and then what that created was a big divot <laughs> in the breast. And it didn't, it wouldn't go away, of course. Uh, and so I do all my surgeries through a circumareolar incision, you know, 99% of them you can do. It's a little more difficult. You have to have, you know, retractors and it's, uh, but you get used to it. And, and uh, circumareolar incision is right around the nipple. So you make, make that little half moon incision because that's erectile tissue, the nipple. I don't have to tell women that. Um, and that hides an incision uh, pretty well. And so what I did was instead of making an incision right over the nipple or right over the tumor, I made the incision and I went down about a centimeter or so and then I tunneled over and that created a wall of support. So when I took the tumor out, that wall of support never, never caved in or never disfigured the breast. And uh, you can actually take a fair amount of tissue out without uh, a cosmetic uh, deficit. But still, that was still surgery and still radiation and chemo and everything and, and long about 2000 uh, partial breast irradiation came out so traditionally we were told you had to do uh, six weeks of radiation external beam radiation so the whole chest was basically radiated um, with a booster at the end five days a week for 
six weeks. And when partial breast irradiation came out, I jumped on that right away. Um, and what that was, was a, uh, it's like a Foley catheter that we put in the bladder to drain urine, but it, instead it had a little port where you could put a, a radiation seed through there. The radiation therapist could do it. You did the lumpectomy and you blew the balloon up and it abutted, it abutted the, the, where the tumor was 360. So 90% uh, of the local recurrences, uh, if you do a lumpectomy, are within one centimeter. And that basically killed that one centimeter, okay? Uh, and that was twice a day for five days instead of five days a week for six weeks. So that wasn't a quantum leap, but it certainly was a step in the right direction. And you didn't get the peau de orange, the, you know, for French for orange peel skin, and you didn't get the shrinking of the breast and, and the sunburn and the whole thing because everything was underneath there. So I did about 45 of those, uh, including the development of, there's a lot, of, a lot of tumors that are pretty close to the skin. And, and when you take that out, everybody's after negative margins. Um, and when you took that tumor out, sometimes it was within a centimeter. So that was too close to use the catheter because it, it would have killed the skin. So I came up with an idea. <laughs> I took a, an Oreo-sized piece of fat out of the abdominal wall, and, you know, about like that or so. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And a centimeter thick. And I just tack that on like a little uh, cushion mm -hmm. uh, over the lumpectomy site where the, where the where it was uh, less than a centimeter. And that I did about 45 of those. And I have yet, that was, that was like in 2002 or something like that. And I have yet to see one of my patients have a local recurrence. So that really worked well, you know, really worked well. Um, and then, uh, so that was that. Uh, and I continued to do that. Um, and then IORT came out, uh, which is interoperative radiation therapy. Again, from the Tumor Institute of Milan. We don't give these guys credit. I mean, every, almost every advance in breast cancer that the United States supposedly came up with came from the Tumor Institute of Milan, <laughs> from lumpectomies to neoadjuvant chemotherapy to IORT. Umberto Vernisi and Giovanni Bonadonna, um, and both of them are not here with us, so rest in peace. But those guys were really trailblazers, okay? Um, and and um, when IORT came out, that was 20 minutes of radiation during the lumpectomy. So the surgeon did the lumpectomy. It's a little, it's, the machine's a little bit bigger than a suitcase, you know, and it has an arm on it with a ball, and it just goes into the cavity where you did the lumpectomy, and it too sterilizes the centimeter, but only for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So when the patient woke up in the recovery room, her surgery was done and her radiation was done. So that was a quantum leap. And then I'm thinking, you know, back in the early 90s, there was a, there was a, a, a doctor, Ken Ramey, and he was at uh, um, John Wayne Cancer Center in Santa Monica. And I, I got to know him because he was using cryosurgery um, for metastatic uh, colon cancer to the liver. So when you start taking somebody's part of somebody's liver out, they, they don't do well. They either bleed out on the table on you um, or, or they have a really horrendous post-op course. And they never quite get back to where they were when you, because your liver is pretty darn important. If you're taking a lot out of it, that takes a lot out of the human being. And so he just froze those things and it didn't do anything, you know, for longevity, but it certainly helped their quality of life. And I thought, wait a minute, <laughs> if we're, if we're telling people now that you could do 20 minutes of radiation and the holy grail of six weeks doesn't make any difference anymore, then maybe I could use the cryo on, on breast cancer because you're just, you're, you're theoretically killing the cancer, but you're just using a different method. 
So if you're using a, a, an AR-15 or a shotgun, it's who's ever on the receiving end of that isn't going to do well. And so about six years ago, um, you know, I started to, to, to do it. And uh, I did three cases the first day. Uh, never do that again because uh, <laughs> it's pretty physically draining. Uh, aside from the emotional effects. Um, and uh, the last patient was uh, a lady who had had a uh, lumpectomy and it had a recurrence and she had implants. And I think she's on my website, a little interview there. And, um, you know, she had waited most of the day. Of course, NPO, which means nothing by mouth. Um, and so, Right after we, we finished, um, she says, geez, I'm hungry, let's go across the street. <laughs> so, so there's a kind of a high-end uh, French at American restaurant right across the street, takes about you know, one minute to walk over there called Lavender Bistro in La Quinta. You can Google it, really neat place. And within 15 minutes, she's, she's having lobster salad and toasting with a little champagne. And of course, uh, I've been castigated for that. Uh, but, you know, these women, these women came in because they all know, all these women know better than men know, like about prostate cancer, because nobody shares that info generally. But women talk about breast cancer, and they've seen the problems, and they've seen the horrendous results, and families broken apart, bankruptcies, bodies destroyed, the whole thing. So they come in, oh, I got breast cancer, oh God, you know, and then, and then none of that stuff happens. I mean, you resume normal activity. Right. So I not only took it out of the OR, I took it out of the system altogether. <laughs> I mean, if we, and then, and my wife said, hey, do you know what you did? And I said, well, I hope I killed the cancer, which is still dead, by the way, about six years after. And I said, well, you know, I hope I killed the cancer. And she says, no instead of waking up in a hospital with a tube in her, in her throat and her breast disfigured or off, she's over here having lobster salad. And immediately, just walk right over, you know. I mean, I, I've had a patient, which I didn't recommend, and I was, you know, castigated for this. You know, she went out and played 18 holes of golf after. I've had patients fly to the south of France three days later, go to Las Vegas the next day. I mean, it's just... And the whole thing was, all the nightmare was over. But look, it, it's not for everybody, okay? Um, this whole thing is predicated on finding small tumors. And right, I have right. to correct you a little bit. If, if that's in my website, the three to five millimeters, that's really optimistic. You could find one. The smallest tumor I found is four millimeters, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, which is, a, uh, people don't know, it's about the size of a pea, okay? And, and um, as Alexander said, I've, I've been at this for 40 years. And, you know, just off the top of my head, I, I can probably only talk about two girls that had five millimeter tumors that had the capacity to metastasize or spread. So right. the idea is if you can actually get these things and get it off, so I've come like full circle back to getting it all, except it's not <laughs> trying to destroy a woman, it's preserving her like we were never there. And of course you saw the pictures and, and you can see, um, yes. it's, it's unbelievable. It and is I, unbelievable. And, and the first, yeah, the first case I did, I, I said, holy cow, if, if this thing works, this is miraculous. I mean, this is, this is, a, this is a real game changer. And everybody talks about game changers and stuff, and, and this, this one is. And so what I did was, <coughs> excuse me, about 2007, I was fortunate enough to be a principal investigator with uh, a genetics test, uh, and that company's no longer here. They launched it right at the, <laughs> where the downturn in the economy came, and the recession, and nobody back then, no one back then was interested in any genetics. And it was just a bunch of 
stuff you had to put in your lexicon and talk to patients and you weren't being reimbursed and who cared and uh, whatever. But it worked. I did about 600 of those things. Uh, and they put it, they put it in the front page of the paper, the Desert Sun back then, April 1st, 2007, I think. If you go back, you can find it. Um, and it was in Sunday, Sunday morning. And Monday morning, <laughs> we went to the office and we had about 30 women lined up. You know, so I knew that without, without any real, you know, fanfare or anything, these women desperately wanted to find an answer that grandma didn't have. And so now what I've, what I've done is I've kind of divided the, not kind of, I divided the, the practice into two parts. One is the lavender way. One is the lavender procedure. So the lavender way paves the way for the lavender procedure. Meaning that when a woman comes in, you know, basically if I had these, uh, if anybody knows President Trump, I've written him, you know, more time, I'm running out of ink. Um, <laughs> and, and you know, I, I hear he's busy at the moment. Let, yeah, well, let me just interrupt you for, for, for one sure, second, yeah. because I, I want to make sure that everyone understands what what you are describing, because I have seen this and, and I'm kind of familiar with what, what you're describing. But for, for people that haven't seen this, I just want to make sure that they understand. Oh, Basically, yeah, you're yeah. going in and freezing the tumor. Correct. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and what you're saying, if I understand, if I understand you correctly, that um, obviously the smaller the size, the, the more likely we will have successful procedure. The That's larger true. the size, the, the more likely Correct. we we are going. We may be dealing with this this poor poor thing. May be dealing with metastasis. Yeah, yeah Even yeah. after even after surgery. Yeah. So we do. Uh, genetics tests on all those tumors. So we not only know the size, we know the family history. Uh, we know that it's, once you do the genetics work up on that tumor, there's no, it doesn't have any aces up its sleeve. We right. know exactly what we're up against or not, okay? And uh, like I said, at, at, at five to eight millimeters, you know, you're, you're in the ballpark. Um, and, and this is only concerned with the breast. Not concerned with lymph nodes, not concerned with metastases. Just what are you going to do with the breast to make it not come back there? Okay, so she ends up with a whole breast, okay, and not disfigured. Uh, the goal, obviously, if we're going to push this, which I did, um, was to eliminate surgery, chemo, and radiation, period. And you have my paper, I think. Yes. Um, you know, so I divided the patients into three groups. Group one was an ideal patient where you could see it on ultrasound, which is basically mandatory, um, easily seen on ultrasound. And you, and you have to put that probe, you shish kebab this, just like you're making a shish kebab or your barbecue. Yeah, it's under real time ultrasound and you can see that probe. This takes a little finesse. You, you can't do it blindfolded. It sounds like, oh, you just stick that in there and everything. You know, it takes a, a stereoscopic mind, as my my uh, neurosurgery teacher at Loyola used to say. You know, that's a <laughs> stereoscopic mind. Yeah, okay. You know, so you, you have to shish kebab that tumor. Yeah. And then, you know, and then the machine helps. You can set, you know, depending upon what you, how aggressive that tumor is, you can set the time limit on, how big that, because once you push that button, that freeze ball starts to grow. And you can set the limits on that bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> so instead of, instead of surgically removing the correct. tumor, and as you said, another, did you say another centimeter around the yeah, yeah. issue? Basically, you're freezing that, that whole area. Yeah, plus normal tissue around it. Right. So we never... And, and this is hard for people to get, you know, because they've been in, just inculcated in them for a hundred years. You have to get clear margins. You don't right. know what you're doing without clear margins. And then, and then the pathologist is all upset because he didn't get clear margins. And the, oh my God, uh, it's just or the lymph node dissection. Mm -hmm. So let me tell you just how how we handle lymph nodes. You know, if we have a larger tumor or something, you know, a centimeter tumor. 
which is about the size of a dime, has been there on average about 10 years growing from a single cell. Right. So cancer does what it does. So an infiltrating cancer, the kind that spreads and, and, and kills people, uh, that, that has the ability, it's called neoangiogenesis or angiogenesis. It has the ability to create blood vessels and start to nourish itself where there weren't any blood vessels. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yes. <laughs> and there's like, like a cascade. There's no pregnancy. Yeah, there's a cascade of, of chemical reactions uh, that, that are necessary to do that. But it does it, and it probably does it, you know, in the first, after the first four years or something. And so how come everybody isn't dying then if you have metastatic disease? Well, because we have nat our immune system, if you've been good to your body, works pretty well. We have natural killer cells that have nothing to do except search out, you know, single cancer cells and kill them. Uh, as you're aware, you know, uh, by the time men to get to be 80 years old, <laughs> about 100% of them are going to have prostate cancer. Yeah. So not everybody, uh, not all the men are dying on the street from prostate cancer. Oh, you know, that's part of the reason, the natural killer cells. Uh, but yeah, so, so the crux of this thing is besides saving bodies and saving money, I, I, I worked it out one time and it's, we'd, we'd save about $10 billion a year here in this country um, to, to institute like lavender way and lavender, you know, clinics. And so the idea is a woman comes in when she's 20 something, uh, when she's ready, okay, not 50. I mean, our national guidelines are 50. I, I tell you, I, I, I could have probably helped Miss Venezuela who died here about five years ago of metastatic breast cancer at age 26, okay? So there's a lot of those women, uh, yes. especially in my country, African-American girls get this triple negative cancer, which is the American College of Surgeons in 09 did a study, was the largest study on African-American girls. And their conclusion was they're getting this in their late 30s. It's triple negative. It's very different. That means it's not, it's, it's estrogen, progesterone, negative hormone receptors. So you can't take tamoxifen or any other anti-estrogen. It's no good. And they're very aggressive. Yeah. And so, the, well, you can't, and you can't do, what are you going to do, mammography every six months on these women? Uh, you can't because, you, you, you know, you will give them cancer because radiation's cumulative. Yes. Uh, so if you start, you know, in your late 30s or so, 35 or so, and you're getting mammography all the time, you know, it's, it's, uh, it can be injurious as well. So the trick is to know when the risk is. So we can, this is something we didn't have when I started surgery in 79 or 80. Uh, you know, you were hoping against hope you didn't get breast cancer. Well, I can tell you <laughs> your lifetime risk and your next five year risk, and it's accurate. And so using that, once we get that back, we know what a particular, what an individual's risk is, and then we, then we, we alter uh, the, the uh, imaging sequence. So, for instance, we might get mammography in January, and then she comes and sees me, and we do an infrared and ultrasound and physical exam. So twice a year, you're getting a formal look-see at your breast. And that almost, if you know what you're doing, uh, that almost guarantees that you're not going to find a golf ball size cancer that's been sitting there for, you know, decades, years. Okay. Yeah. And that, you know, and, and that, you know, uh, freezing it isn't going to work. Um, so that's the idea. So if we can find a, a, a small tumor, then yeah, after you explain the options, mastec not doing anything is an option. Uh, was on the cover of Time magazine for DCIS, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was just going to ask you about your opinion about DCIS. And yeah, the, the, my opinion is, yeah, if it's not so big, you know, if it's five centimeters or so, that's the DCIS is ductal carcinoma in situ. It's the, <clears throat> it's, it's the precursor to invasive cancer. But it's walled off. No? no yeah, it's, it's not moving any. It's not, it's right. not going to kill you, okay? 
But what, what's the percentage of, of DCAS that will become invasive? Uh, that that's the question. See, back in the 70s, we treated all DCIS the same, and that was a simple mastectomy. And you didn't have to do the lymph nodes because by definition, it wasn't invasive. Right. Yeah, we found out about, about 5% of those DCIS patients harbored a, an occult invasive cancer, a small occult in invasive cancer, which is, means a a cancer that we didn't know until the pathologist told us it was there. Um, and, and so, yeah, yeah, if it's, this, this is another upside of, of cryo. If you decide, look, I got DCIS and it's a centimeter and a half. Okay, well, you know, can't really see the, you know, it doesn't really show up on the, on the film that well. We can see the, I can see the clip, the titanium clip that they did the biopsy. So I know where that is and I know where, the, where it was in the mammogram. So I know basically where it is. You could also do a bracket technique, uh, which is a localization that we do if we're going to do a lumpectomy on, on, a, on a tumor that we can't feel. We, we do a pre-op needle localization. It's actually a wire that gets put in there. And so you could, if you did a bracket technique, you could, uh, on DCIS patients, you could know where that tumor was basically, okay? And so, yeah, so you go ahead and do that. What do you got to lose? Um, well, maybe two months, you know, so is that going to alter anything? Probably not. Because at two months, whether it's DCIS or invasive cancer, whatever it is, she gets another mammogram and a core biopsy. We want to make sure that cancer's dead. Um, and if it isn't, then you can either redo a lavender or a cryo, right. whatever you want to call it, or you move on to lumpectomy. You say, hey, I tried this, doesn't work, I'll have the surgery, you know. So <laughs> let, let me ask you, I, you, you're obviously using, amongst other imaging techniques, you're also using thermography in, in, in your clinic. Do you do before and after your procedure? Do you use thermography to see whether the blood vessels are, are different after your procedure, whether they, she's moving in the right direction, wrong direction? Well, yeah, they are different. Yeah, it's different. Yeah, so it's, it's but I don't, I don't bet somebody's life on that. I bet somebody's life on the core, <laughs> on the pathologist. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's see, none of this stuff. If if, if you think thermography, or I don't use that term. I use infrared because um, okay. the military uses it, and they're using they're they're not using it because it doesn't work. It works really well. Okay, and so you know, it's it's um, you you, you want to. None of these things are 100%. Not infrared, not ultrasound, not MRI, not PET-CT, sure. not mammography, not tomosynthesis. Uh, none of that stuff is 100%. It's a, it's, it's a combination of that stuff, which we use uh, without radiation, namely the you know, infrared, ultrasound, and a thing called shirt touch. Um, that, you know, besides your physical exam yeah. uh, and your experience, um, <laughs> you know, that says, hey, this woman's really okay. And, and then the other kicker is that the vast majority of those cancers, if you find them below a centimeter in size, they're going to be hormone positive. Okay. Um, that's the reason the girls are getting breast cancer and we're not. Okay. I, in, in the 40 years, I maybe treated six guys with breast cancer. You know, it's just, you know, it's just a rare thing. Uh, and so those girls are going to be on, you know, an antiestrogen of, you know, whatever, depending on their, you know, where they are, premenopausal or postmenopausal. You know. right. And speaking about men and um, prostate cancer, I, mean, yeah. I, I get this all the time, too. Uh, are you able to use this technique on, on prostate as well? No. Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 The cryo, you betcha. Yeah. 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 And, and just, and if there's any guys out there listening to this, <laughs> the, the days are really gone when 
you know, you have to bend over and the guy puts on the rubber glove. Okay. Right. That's, you know, I, I don't know. News. That's good news. No. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> because the, the, the MRIs are so sophisticated. It'll, it'll actually X, it, it'll measure how big your prostate is and then it'll point to, it, it'll Location. put little, like little, little X's where the suspicious area is and then they just go in there and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and biopsy it and then you know what you, you know. But yeah, there's no glove and there's no bend over. <laughs> well. <laughs> or there should, you know, there should, if you don't have access to, you know, an MRI or something, I mean, if you're in, uh, in Canada, in Canada, <laughs> up on, well, I was going to say like, in, you know, in yellow knife, you know, <laughs> there, you know, yeah. I mean, and, and let me tell you, it, that's another real, you know, uh, the National Cancer Institute said that breast cancers, they sent out a memo about three years ago that by 2030, breast cancer in the United States will double. Okay. So, we'll, yeah. So we're going to be having uh, upwards of 400,000 women. Okay. And so we'll lose, we'll lose uh, uh, just in the United States. Uh, my, my figures are, um, about a quarter of a million women pass away from breast cancer each and every year. So you're saying that in about 10 years, we are likely uh, to lose almost double that, half a million people? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. That's and and then, you know, let me tell you about these statistics. Um, when, when a patient dies, um, which I have very few, <laughs> thank God, because I don't think I could take it. I'd close the doors, really. Um, I don't know how my oncologist, uh, he loses half of his, you know, clientele in a year. <laughs> you know, I don't know how he does it. Yeah, but uh, they, get, they get constant supply of new, new clients. Oh, yeah, that's great. You know, that's yeah. real. That's, uh, you know, okay, Let, let's not get cynical. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's just, um, you know, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, but go ahead, ask me another question. So... You're using all these techniques to basically diagnose and, and treat without surgery, basically by using your technique, which you call lavender. Um, but you also talked about the lavender way. Yeah. Is, is, this, is this something that you can, you can kind of describe in terms of how would you prevent, I, I realize, of course, I'm, I'm asking a surgeon, <laughs> But how would you prevent breast cancer? Um, well, I think there's, and I, 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 I uh, yeah. Well, I think you have to know your risk, which we talked about the genetics test. Right. And it's called gene type, G E N E T Y P E, and you're even in Canada, they'll just yeah. FedEx the darn thing up to you. It's a little kit, so it's a buccal mucosa swab, so you don't have to take blood or anything. So you could do that for sure. Uh, that's like almost mandatory. Okay, everybody would get it if I was president of the United States. You know, the the ball game's over now. We can't be, you know, having this uh, just guesswork all the time. Are you considering uh, running in in twenty twenty four? No. Well, look, I ran for Congress against Sonny Bono. You know. Oh wow. You no, know, I was on the ballot. You know, I got six thousand over six thousand votes in nineteen ninety four. You can Google it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, he just sprinkled stardust on everybody. <laughs> he got something like 30,000 Name recognition. Oh, but, it's a whole name but, recognition. Right, but back, back to genetic tests. And genetic yeah. tests is basically that you are using. Gives you also um, statistical probability of yeah. uh, getting cancer within the next five yes. years, 10 years. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So knowing that, look, I mean, there's certain things, lifestyle changes. Everybody, there's a, you know, a hundred, you know, there's probably more than a hundred papers out there that say, if you do regular exercise, you know, you're going to cut that risk by 20%, no matter what. If you eat everything you see in the grocery store, 90% of that is, is on your way to killing yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so that's not good. You have to learn how to eat right. Uh, and the sooner you do that, the better off you're going to be from your heart to all this other stuff. Um, 
you know, and, and so those are the two basic things. And then, you know, um, I'm not against alcohol, you know, uh, but, you know, I don't think you need to drink every day, you know, uh, having three or four, <laughs> you know, three or four martinis, that's not going to help. So limiting your alcohol intake, limiting smoking, limiting, you know, uh, not limiting your exercise and not limiting, you know, what you eat correctly, you know. How do you feel about caffeine? Yeah, it's okay. If you, yeah. you know, yeah, I mean, if, if some girl comes in with breast pain, it's either organic cause like a, like a cyst, you know, yeah. and the cysts get bigger and they, you know, the, 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 uh, the breast is very sensitive. So, when, when that cyst starts pushing on the tissue, it's like somebody taking a hammer and hitting right. your thumb, you mm -hmm. know? So that's a, a cause for breast pain. Uh, but a lot of times it's just hormonal related or caffeine, anything that has caffeine, tea, chocolate, soft drinks, ice cream, candy, that whole thing. So again, I mean, I wouldn't eat a pint of ice cream a day, you know? Um, and I'm not against ice cream. <laughs> In other words, everything in moderation. But I, I find that, you know, just, just two cups of coffee uh, a day, and we're not talking about uh, any specific general coffee, uh, sure. will, will convert 60% of your testosterone to estradiol. Which uh, is the heavy hitter. Right, right. Yeah. So, again, we don't know who is going to react to, to this. Some people will be susceptible. Some people may, may be less susceptible. But I, I always advise as people, if, if you can, cut, cut coffee out. Cut, I mean, look, it's an addiction. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons why you do the genetics test, because then you know, God, if you're really super high risk, holy mackerel, you know, then you're, then you're just asking for it, you know. Uh, and then the other time we use the genetics test is because you're, you're really, you know, if somebody comes, that's why they come in in their late 20s somehow, okay? Right. And not to scare them, but they, they get in doc, they sh you show them what we're doing, you, you, and they say, oh my gosh, yeah, that makes sense, instead of looking like grandma, you know. And then you, you, know, you have maybe 30 years, because most women aren't going to get breast cancer like Miss Venezuela at 26. They're, it's going to come, you know, postmenopausally or right there, you know. Mm -hmm. And so you have, you know, 20, 30 years of good lifestyle practices to head this darn thing off. Uh, and then if you do the genetics tests and you hit menopause and you're high risk, you're on an anti-estrogen. We didn't mention that I was the author of our country. Well, you did mention it. Uh, the, yeah, the, the first clinical trial for, for breast cancer prevention with tamoxifen, right. which is the only drug we had back then, okay? And, and so, that's what I use, and it, uh, you know, our government spent 68 million on that idea, and it turns out it prevents it 50% of the time. So that's active prevention. Now I wouldn't use probably tamoxifen. There's a drug called Evista or Roloxifen made by Eli Lilly, which was first on the market for treatment and prevention of postmenopausal osteoporosis. So, uh, and you get a double hit out of that drug if you can tolerate it, you know. Uh, you get the bone help, and then you get the lowers the risk of uh, breast cancer by 50%. So if we didn't, because almost 90%, 89%, whatever it is, um, of the women who get breast cancer have no family history. They don't, you know, so that's why I don't harp on these risk factors, except the genetic one, uh, like being overweight and all that. Um, so how, how accurate is, is this genetic test? 99 percent really yeah, and right. instead of tamoxifen and they, and whoever is taking tamoxifen definitely they should consult with their physician a great we're not, we're not asking them to to to, to get off but instead of oh. tamoxifen how do you feel about indole 3 carbonyl dim things like that calcium deglucarate you can it's you know because everything's out there now for these yeah. patients you know so just so my job isn't to shove any of this down people's throat. My job is to say, yeah, you want to take dim, you know, and, and do that. Uh, okay. You know, 
whatever, you know, it's just, okay. it, you know, I mean, it's, it, dep it depends on where your risk is and stuff. And you think that's going to, I mean, this, my country has spent hundreds of millions of dollars on these clinical trials and they, you know, some of this stuff works. It's just not all garbage. It, and, and, it, and, it, and it, it saves lives if you, you know, use it right. And so, uh, but, you know, everybody has their own opinion about what they want to do. Um, uh, you know, like, you know, like there's a growing, as you're well aware, you know, there's a growing, there's a burgeoning, I'll say, population of women who don't want to do mammography who don't want to do chemotherapy, don't want to have, you know, don't want to have radiation, don't want to have this, don't want to have, you know, is that what, you know, that's a decision that, you know, sometimes blueberries aren't the answer. You know, when, it, when you have metastatic disease four years later, uh, blueberries aren't going to help, you know. Uh, so, yeah, as, as long as, as long as everybody knows what you say what you espouse or what you you know direct them toward and they want to do something else then fine i mean i i have a, a girl who has you know breast cancer hormone positive tumor and she's on chinese herbs against my i said you know that's what you want to do then you know okay but we got to watch this close you know so you can't this isn't the soviet union yet I think you should be running for 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 an office. <laughs> you know, I mean, look. Every, when I was growing up, everything was black and white. Okay, the yeah. Lone Ranger got the bad guy in a half hour, and the same as Gene Autry. You know, and now everything's blurred. You know, and so it's a little difficult. Um, but yeah, I mean, people have to be informed. What's out there, and. The, you know, our job isn't to say, oh, look at Mary in her casket there, you know, geez, she didn't get breast cancer, but every day she spent was miserable. <laughs> That's not what we're after. You know, if somebody is at higher risk for breast cancer and, and still needs the hormones, I, I do bioidentical hormones, you know, because right. there's the three estrogens, the estradiol is a heavy hitter, Ester, estriol is the, is the one that's supposed to be beneficial, you know, whatever. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, so if you're, if you're higher risk and you're menopausal and you need the estrogen, then by God, give her the estrogen, you know, you just accelerate the imaging. So you're looking at them at least twice a year and you have the genetics test on her. So, you know, if you're on shaky ground or, or you're on solid ground, and if you're on shaky ground, she knows that say, look, we're really pushing the envelope here, but if you need it, we're just going to head this darn thing off, you know, and, and catch it when it's, when we can do a lavender procedure. And um, that's liquid nitrogen, by the way. Um, um, and it's m almost minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 180 Celsius up in north of the border. Yeah, um, that's, that's our <laughs> spring temperature. So, I mean, if you stick your, actually, I, you know, I'm a surgeon. So I, you know, when I looked at this, I just ran my hand through it. You know, <laughs> and it's actually warm. Uh, well, it burns. Yeah, and, and it's and it's like granulated, so it's like uh, like almost like it has sand in it, but not, but really fine. But if you stick your finger in there for thirty seconds and flick it, it'll come right off. So you have when you uh, when you push that button, boy, you it's game on. So you got to be really right on with that probe and everything. You know, so. So what happens? You basically come in, you freeze the tumor, the surrounding tissue, and like you said, you know, 15 minutes later, uh, you know, they don't feel anything. They don't have to go through recovery. They don't have to stay in a hospital. They don't have to throw up after uh, anesthetics. Yep. Uh, you avoid all this, all this stuff. Now, does it stay frozen or you basically just kind of kill that, that area and it, yeah, it's, 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 it's a necrotic tissue inside. Yeah. It takes, if you can, some of the good, depending on how big the tumor is, I mean, some of the girls, you know, I've, I've tackled three centimeter tumors. Okay. 
right. uh, on women that would not have any other procedure. They're not going to have any surgery. They're, they're, and I didn't want the tumor to be growing through the skin because that's what it does. Sure. And, and if you looked at my presentation, you saw three, three girls where they, you know, was growing for seven years. I mean, come on. I don't know, you know, what to answer those girls. Uh, but yeah, um, you know, we, the, we don't take the tumor out. The tumor stays there. It's dead. We confirmed that on core biopsy after two months uh -huh. and ultrasound. You can see the ultrasound's almost as good as the mammography in terms of seeing a recurrence or so. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it. Uh, I, I thought at the beginning, I thought, geez, this is how are they going to withstand minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit? Uh, how's that going to, but it never affected them. Not one patient said, oh, it's so cold. I can't, you know, of course I, I used local anesthesia. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's basically Kelvin uh, zero, right? Yeah. Um, and then it, it, it takes, so if you have a, like a golf ball size freeze ball, yeah. Okay. So we can extend that. Like I said, we can extend the size of the freeze ball. So it encompasses five centimeters. Yep. I mean, it's a huge friggin' freeze ball, you know? And so it takes about a year and it resolves slowly. It's kind of like getting a black eye, you know, it'll take about two weeks. It, it's dark blue and then purple and then it's green right. and then it's yellow. And then it finally goes away. So, the body reabsorbs this, okay? And it takes about a year or so. And a lot of the girls, some girls are left with nothing. You know, it's like keloid scars. You know, some people, you make an incision and they got a big keloid, and so, you know. Um, so some girls, there's nothing. It's all gone. The whole mm -hmm. thing is gone. I can't see anything. There's nothing. Can't feel anything. Can't see anything on mammography or ultrasound. Most of the girls are are left with a you know, like a like a five to eight millimeter mass that just kind of, it's like a singularity. <laughs> it just goes right down, and there there it is. It's so dense. It's just right. there. I was trying to come up with something uh, like a, a probe that would go in there and suck that thing out of there. You know, so you know, just maybe, maybe it's better left alone. Well, man, who knows? Well, let, let, let me just do one other thing. There's, it's not new evidence. Uh, it's called the abscopal effect. And that is that when these dead cancer cells are resorbed by the body and the immune system recognizes that, right. then it, perf it makes specific antibodies against your tumor. Okay? Uh -huh. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take... Yeah, it's pretty cool. And so that that's going to take probably 20 years to figure out if that's, you know, going to have any effect in terms of preventing recurrences and stuff like that. But that's doc that's a well documented effect, positive effect. That's another positive effect of cryoablation. So so your follow up, you 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 continue to follow up after the procedure for every six how months. Long? Every, every six, six months. months for 3 years. For you three know, years. Ultrasound, you know, we do the mammogram yearly and then ultrasound physical exam and document that they're taking their anti estrogen. <laughs> you know, you got to, some girls need help. Right. If, if they're estrogen uh, positive. Yeah. yeah. And, okay. and so, yeah. What, what happens? So, what are the numbers? Tell, tell, tell me, tell us how many people have had the recurrence. In with uh, in the past six years that you've been doing this, uh, two out of how many DCIS out of about thirty cases. You know, it, it's not like I have hundreds and hundreds of cases. That's why right. it's it's important that other people could could uh, document this. Uh, and, and and if I can do it, I can teach. That's another benefit of this. That in Countries that don't have an oncologist on every block, you know, uh, and no access to chemotherapy or any of this other sophisticated stuff, 
I could teach a, a, a general practitioner how to do this. This isn't brain surgery. You got to know how to do it. You got to practice, you know, I practiced with a, a turkey breast and an olive, <laughs> you know, and, a, and an olive and a raisin. So if I could hit the yep. olive, then, you maybe know. People, maybe people shouldn't uh, hear this. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I mean, look, doctors, they just are, you know, this don't, can't operate on somebody and not kill them. You have to, you have to that's what they call yes. practice. <laughs> Practicing injection on, on an orange. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, it just, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I tell you, it's in the book I'm writing now. The first, the first operation I did was a bilateral inguinal hernia, and the chief resident and the and the junior resident was on one side, and the junior resident was doing, I was doing it with the attending, okay, and I had looked everywhere, you know, uh, you look at these and says, well, the problem with the surgeon is. When you drop that knife, <laughs> it's not like an er eraser on a pencil. You can erase that incision. So you're stuck with it, you know. So I, I hesitated like for about a minute or so. And he, and he said, I'll never forget this. He said, well, we're slow but poor. <laughs> and I thought, oh, thanks a lot, buddy. You know, now, I mean, if you close my eyes, I could do an inguinal hernia, you know, uh, from anywhere, you know, but, but back then I, I was my first time. I didn't know anything, you know, right. and, and so, you know, it takes, it, it takes some experience to, to, to feel comfortable with betting people's lives on what you know or don't know, you know, and if you don't want to do it, then, then you shouldn't be doing it. You know, if you don't have that confidence, like a fighter pilot, you know, if that guy isn't ready to rock, you know, he should be, you know, air traffic controller or something. Um, so going back 50 years in the mm -hmm. 60s and 70s, as soon as a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, yeah. mastectomy. Oh, yeah. Um, and then probably what, uh, 90s, 80s, 90s, that we're switching more to lumpectomies. Yeah, um, it, took, it took about 20 years or so for a lumpectomy to become standard of care. I mean, that's another thing. See, if we had all these, you know, not as a comprehensive breast center and every, everything, in our, yeah, come on. If we had these centers mandatorily hooked up to a central thing, and if, you, if we look for, like, for, if we go back to Umberto Bernice's paper on lumpectomy, if, if I was in charge uh, back then in 79, that paper came out, I would fax everybody and say, look, this is what we're going to do now. And everybody would be doing it right away instead of taking 20 years and people and doctors afraid they're going to get sued and, oh, you didn't take the breast off and the cancer came back, you know, come on. I mean, it just depends on what everybody wants, but. It's a very slow pro uh, process. Oh, and, it just, uh, it's just. Uh, I like hope, I hope that, and, and sincerely pray that uh, your method I mean, it's not your method uh, per se. No, it's not my method. I'm no, just... no, but I'm, I'm just calling it that. That yeah. method of that you are describing is becoming uh, more popular. That more more people are interested in that. And and you know what? I suspect that it's the women that are going to demand oh, gonna... from, from their doctors. No doubt. I mean, it's it's the women who not the other way around who propelled lumpectomy. That's right. Yeah, you bet. And it's the women who also argued for ultrasound to make sure, uh, and I believe that actually happened in your state in California, to make sure that someone with dense breast understands that I have dense breast and please yeah. in, 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 do yeah, the, ultrasound on me instead yeah. of doing mammography, which, which is not very useful. In yeah, the, the, law, the law, well, that's where infrared comes in because it doesn't make any difference how dense the breast is. Uh, but the law in California stops short of saying, oh, if you have whatever percentage of dense breasts, you automatically get a, an ultrasound. You just have, it says you have to notify them that they have dense breasts. Well, thank you very much. You know, now what, you know? So you have to have somebody that's versed in, in all this and takes time, to, takes time to explain this to the girls. And, and so they're not, I mean, if you come into my place, we look, we look at the mammogram and she can point to say, what's that? What's that? You know, explain that. 
and we go over last year's and the year before. So we look at three years, see if there's any changes. So they understand that looking back, you get your, if there's something on this mammogram, was it there before? You know, yeah. Yeah, it's good to have a baseline. Yes, sir. And, and I totally agree with you that uh, women should not wait till they're in their 50s or 60s to start looking at their breast health. No. Uh, because basically, if they have an issue at 50 or 60, most likely it started way yeah. back, most oh, yeah. likely at yeah. least a decade back. Sure, at least. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and that's all this time lost, you know. I mean, it, it's, so, it's just... I apologize to any family practitioners are out there, but these guys are, are girls, guys. Uh, you know, with laboratory stuff and seeing HMO patients, because I, I helped a, one, of my, one of my colleagues for a while, and they were getting like over 200 lab results a day, uh, plus mammograms and whatever else. And it was just almost impossible. So you just... You looked at the uh, impression, uh, da, 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 you know, yeah. you didn't, you didn't have time to sit and talk to the patient about this. So the, the whole, all that stuff goes out the window. You, when I made the decision to open the first comprehensive breast center in 1988, when there was no such thing, except for Mel Silverstein and Van Eyes that I knew of, um, you know, there was a chair right in front of me, you know, two, one for the husband, one for the, for the patient and you know when I was doing general surgery hernias and stomachs and gallbladders or whatever you know I, I didn't necessarily care you know about your risk factors for breast cancer or your you know if you were getting beat up at home or you're getting you know this or that or your your periods are, weren't right or you know and, and so I it opened up a whole new <laughs> ball game for me to listen to what women are going through and to try and help them uh, avoid all this stuff, you know. And so that takes a full-time commitment to women um, and, and not do diabetes or something else. And, you know, I'm, and as I said in my TED talk, I think, you know, we have to decide as a country how important women are. And if they're so important, uh, and it should be obvious that I think they are important, uh, then, then we need to at least look at different options instead of doing the same thing all the time and not have such a condescending attitude um, toward stuff like this that is, you know, all FDA approved. I didn't do this in my garage or something. Um, and, and help get it going. That's why the President Trump or whoever is going to be president could, could, could help overnight almost. This isn't something that Oh, if you hear it on the news, oh, the, the new procedure, it'll take about five more years of research. Nah, we can do this overnight. You know, you could do this literally oh, almost overnight. You know, within six months' time, you could have these centers. People that want to do, want to make a career out of this. So they're seeing the same person every time for 30, 40 years. I just saw a patient I saw 30 years ago, you know. <laughs> You know, papers turning yellow in their chart. You know, that's the kind of you know. Well, that's that's the old-fashioned medicine. Well, yeah. I mean, well, yeah. I, I mean, come on. No one has time for that now, unfortunately. Yeah, well, they have to. Make, well, whose fault is that? You know, you 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 darn well make time. That's yeah. why this whole thing is a separate thing. Would be a whole the whole breast. You know, when you get mammograms, when you get this, when you get that. What are we going to do? that's all separate from the, from the whole system, cut it off from the system and get the, cause it's so horrendous. If this was, you know, some kind of rare lymphoma, you know, who cares, you know, but this is so prevalent and it's going to be more prevalent. And we're, we're not helping these women if we're not doing something like this. So, you know, everybody write president Trump. <laughs> Why do you think uh, breast cancer is on the rise? <clears throat> well, there's more of us. Uh, our technology to diagnose things is better. So we're getting these, you know, 
we're, we're finding more cancers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, and I, I think it's just, you know, diet and risk, you know, genetic. Yeah. Pollution. Carcinogens. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a, <laughs> there's a book called uh, what, what, Death by Rubber Duck. And, it, <laughs> and everybody, every kid, you know, when I was growing up, had a little yellow rubber duck. It was, you know, about that big. Yeah. You know, and, and you had it in the bathtub with you. Well, it turns out <laughs> that duck is carcinogenic as hell. Excuse me. <laughs> and then and so are the so are the are the are the you know shower curtains and I mean everything is just yeah, like you know, you're you get a new one and and uh, yeah, you're, you're exposed to everything. I mean everything yeah. is you know wow oh, come on. I mean and you, if you walk in the hospital uh, down here anyway if you walk in the hospital it says right there uh, we use the um, you know chemicals that are cause cancer. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute! I'm coming to you because I got. I want to get rid of. I don't want to have cancer. And you're telling me you use stuff that causes cancer. What's going on? Yeah. So we're just exposed to, uh, you know, a litany of, uh, you know, <laughs> of, of stuff that's carcinogenic. You know, God lord. So, to <laughs> listen. Uh, to end on a to end on a positive note. Sure. Right? To end on a positive note. Uh, what would you say to women who are watching this to encourage them to better their health and not just breast health, to better their health? Because, you know, you're not going to have breast cancer in someone who is totally healthy. Uh, we, we all understand that this is a, um, um, it's just a localized version of, of a systemic disease. Problem, yeah. So how, how, what would you say, to women to better their health? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think you have to want to do it. You know, that's probably the biggest thing, you know. Um, I think, you know, I'm from Chicago, so it was the meat, ca I had, I grew up on, <laughs> you know, steaks and, and potatoes and gravy and a lot of it, you know, and uh, I can't tell you when the last steak I had, you know, no, my wife won't let me. We're, we're pretty much vegetarians, mm -hmm. although I do eat pizza a couple times a month. You know, I just, you know, we're going to be dead a long time. So, hey, come on. I'm from by, the, by the way, Chicago has the best meat. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, that's a debate that uh, I'm sure Ray's in New York would uh, want to defend. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> Chicago has pretty good pizza. And, not, and everybody thinks it's a deep dish. That started with Uno's and Dewey's on Rush yeah. Street in yeah, downtown yeah. there. Uh, but... Chicago pizza is, is, was the thin crust, you know, anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, t you want to have to take charge of your own life. And like we've discussed, the doctors just don't have time to do it anymore. And that's, that's, that's our fault. And, and that's your fault too. Um, you know, you get what you, you know, pay for, you know, uh, and you know, you, you, you got to find a doctor who's going to be, uh, available to listen to you and to help you guide you. Um, there's a there's a guy called Joel Furman. Um, yeah, yeah, Joel. Well known. Yeah, he's um, you know he he tells you to eat bombs, uh, and for, the acronym is like broccoli, onions, mushrooms, spinach. <laughs> I don't know, but we eat that all the time. I mean, you know, it's and then you know, like if you go to I don't want to plug Trader Joe's, but I will. You know, you have to. Um, you have Trader Joe's up there? No. No. Well, see, that's the problem. You know, but you 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 have all this new like Beyond Burgers and stuff. Yeah, you know, Beyond Meat. Beyond. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so stuff like that. So you can make a Beyond Burger taste pretty darn good. And okay. and what and Joel says if you you can't just piecemeal it, you have to cut it off. And so within three months of you stopping your bad diet, your taste buds will change. Okay. Like for instance, I haven't had real milk for, you know, 25 years, you know, it's almond milk or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and the same thing, instead of ice cream, you eat soy ice cream, you know, so it's, so it's, you know, you're, you're eating stuff that's, um, good I you. like, I like your idea that generally that the person takes, 
takes responsibility for their yes, take the, yeah sure it's not it's not your doctor's responsibility it's your responsibility to look after yourself and yeah. then you have to find obviously people that are professionals in the medical uh, community and there are so many different choices that whatever whatever you want basically right now is is available yeah and 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 connect with them because it's very important like like you mentioned before the personal relationship between yourself and your physician it's it's usually it's it's the hand that gives the medicine that's half the medicine yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, it's, it's the girls that, yeah, it goes back to Jeremiah and the Bible in the Old Testament. You know, he was one of the, he and Prophet Ezekiel were the ones that propounded uh, personal responsibility. You know, so it goes all the way back to there. You know, um, uh, a sluggard is somebody who, who, who doesn't want to work and whose desires are unmet. <laughs> so you can't be a sluggard. You have to be on this. And, and it's not that difficult. You know, you, you just have to, to want to do it. You know, and everybody thinks, oh, I'm going to go on a diet. So I'm going to get a little pea and a carrot on my plate. And that's I'm going to be starving. If you eat right, you can eat almost as much as you want. But it's half the calories. Vegetarian, you're not, you're not eating meat, you're eating vegetables you're eating you know and then you have to you know um i'm after my wife to do a cookbook because you know i'm from you know, from chicago so it takes a lot but she she cooks where it satisfies a meat eater you know a carnivore you know i'm pretty darn satisfied all the time and um once in a while yeah i'll, I'll get a pizza you know um you know all this stuff everything everything you put in your mouth I mean, if the best thing to put in your mouth is an organic piece of broccoli right from the field, and the worst thing to put in your mouth is uh, bologna with the stuff in it, then everything's <laughs> in between that. So you say, is this, is this better for me than this? You know, you're, everything you put in your mouth, you should be aware of what, what you're doing long term to your heart, to your brain, to uh, Alzheimer's, to all this stuff. And, and so, yeah, but you have to... Uh, it's kind of like an alcoholic, you know, you got to look at himself in the mirror and say, I'm not going to drink anymore. That's the end of it, you know. And if you don't do that, then yeah, you end up obese, you know, you end up a problem, you know. Well, I, I want to thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sure we can talk about this for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> but uh, yeah. since the attention span on uh, YouTube channels is... Um, anywhere between 30 minutes. seconds to five minutes, we definitely went way over time. Yeah. So I, I want to thank you. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us if anyone wants to uh, write you a question or, or uh, come to your website, uh, can you just tell us where they can find you? Yeah, you can just uh, email me at drbretz at visionarybreastcenter.com, all one word. That's great. And that should get to me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you. And I appreciate, you know, your being there and, and uh, you know, because this isn't, this isn't uh, easy um, for people like us. Uh, you know, uh, we got a lot of colleagues that don't want us around and a system that doesn't want us around and uh, when it should want us around. Uh, let me just do one more thing. Of course. If you, um, I would like the readership here, the listening audience, to either go buy the book or you can go online. It's called The First Cell, and it's by Dr. Raza. And she's a world class hematologist, oncologist, and she just, she's about my age. So, uh, she, you know, they're not going to ruin her career because um, everybody's afraid of that, and that's why nobody speaks up. Um, but, uh, yeah, she just obliterates the system, the denial and the arrogant denial and the, uh, you know, and uh, it, it, so you can go online, the first cell. First cell by Dr. Raza. Yeah. R-A-Z-A. It's a great book. And then you'll, then if you read that first couple chapters, 
you're going to be going, what is, what, what are they doing this to us for? What are they doing this to us for? You know, uh, this is ridiculous. And, and so, yeah, I recommend that. And I'm working on a book now that has stories from, you know, being, you know, growing up and being a surgeon and being, you know, and, and doing what I'm doing and, and what it ends. So, uh, hopefully that'll be, I'm going to self publish it because I'm sure nobody's going to publish it. Just like, they, they, just like they didn't want to do sacrificing America's women. I'm going to self publish that one too. All right. Thank Thanks again. Anytime, man. And, um,